Hi everyone, welcome to Medicine for Dummies. I'm Dr. V. So this is part two of the lesson on acute gastroenteritis. And if you haven't checked out part one yet, you can click here and refer that. So hit a like, subscribe and share and stick around for more as we talk about a new topic every week. Don't forget to check out my other channel for great music, for relaxation and studying. So today we are going to talk about examination and investigation of a patient with acute gastroenteritis. First, let's talk about examination. It's important to carry out a full examination of every pediatric patient, even though the examination should also be focused like the history. We have to examine all four systems, a general examination, a developmental assessment, and other relevant examinations. Here, I am only focusing on the things we cannot miss in a case of acute gastroenteritis. For more elaborate techniques, refer my other videos. Our main focus is to look for evidence to exclude differential diagnoses and to look for complications. The first thing we do in all pediatric patients is the growth assessment because growth is an integral part of childhood. The first thing is to measure height or length. It's important to know that height is measured when a child is more than two years because it takes around two years for the child to be able to stand and walk. If the child is less than two years, we use something called an infantometer to check the length like you can see here. The next thing is to measure the weight, ideal body weight and the BMI. And lastly, the occipitofrontal circumference or OFC. The occipitofrontal circumference is basically the circumference of the baby's head at its widest part. So we have to measure it parallel to the floor and at a level connecting the supraorbital ridges and the external occipital protuberance just above the ears. OFC is usually measured up till about three years because it's a measure of brain growth and the size of the brain usually stops increasing at around that age. In an acute situation, these parameters are unlikely to be affected, but nevertheless, it's important to check them. All these values need to be plotted in graphs. You can see here a graph with length, weight, and age. Note that there are different graphs for different age groups. So we plot the height and weight here and look at which percentile the baby belongs to. Basically, a percentile is the range a child falls into compared to a normal population of children. So the 50th centile is the normal weight or length for an average child of that age. If the patient's percentile lies below this, it means that the child is shorter or less heavy than an average child. If the percentile is above this, it means the child is taller or more obese than an average child. So we can get a better idea on the child's growth than by the value itself. There are also charts for the OFC and BMI just like this one. You can find more about these graphs and how to plot them in my upcoming videos. So, after checking the basic growth parameters, we move on to the focused examination. The first thing is to see if there are any features suggestive of other sinister causes. If you can remember, we considered an array of differential diagnoses in our previous video, and this is only a few of the more important ones with obvious clinical examination findings. So for meningitis, you know that there is meningeal irritation. This can lead to edema and hydrocephalus, where a lot of cerebrospinal fluid accumulates inside the skull. So one finding you can see is a bulging fontanelle. As you know, fontanelles are the places in the skull where the sutures have not fused yet, so it can be felt like a boggy soft area on soft palpation. You can feel and see if the fontanelle is raised and tense, which means there is some fluid accumulation inside. 
There are also other features of meningitis like neck stiffness, Koenig sign, and Brudzinski sign. In the Koenig sign, the leg cannot be extended fully. And in Brudzinski sign, raising the head causes a kind of reflex flexion of the hips and knees. These are all features of meningeal irritation seen in meningitis. The second differential diagnosis we had was ear infection, and here you can look for ear discharges. In tonsillitis, you can examine the oral cavity for tonsillar enlargement and redness of the throat. If there is bacterial infection, you may be able to see pus-filled vesicles on the enlarged tonsils. Next is inflammatory bowel disease. As I said in the previous video, inflammatory bowel disease has extra intestinal manifestations. Some of them are given here. You can get red eye by conditions like uveitis and scleritis, rashes on the skin known as erythema nodosum. You can get arthritis and an array of other features. You can look for a few to just see if they are present. The last is of course intussusception, which I said was the telescoping of one part of bowel into another. In examination, you can see a sausage-shaped mass, like in this picture. So next is the second part of our focused examination. Look for complications. We considered a few different complications in our last video, and two of these show important physical signs. This part is really important because it also carries an integral part of management. So, first and foremost, you have to know how to assess dehydration in a patient. As seen here, there are three types of dehydration. Mild, moderate, and severe. There are also other classifications, but for this session, we will be talking about this one. So mild dehydration doesn't have any abnormal features as you can see here. It's more of a subclinical dehydration and you can see the weight loss of the baby due to dehydration is only about 5% of the previous weight. Moderate dehydration is when 6 to 10% of weight loss occurs and you start to get some clinical features which you have to look for in the examination. The baby may start getting irritable and thirsty. The capillary refill time may be slightly prolonged. As you know, we check for capillary refill time by gently pressing down on the fingertip till it's white and releasing it and counting the seconds till the pinkness returns. Usually this has to be less than 2 seconds, but if it takes more time, it means that the blood flow is sluggish. The pulse rate may increase and the respiratory rate may be elevated. And the blood pressure at this stage could be normal or low normal, meaning it hasn't gone to the state of shock yet. You can check the mucous membranes like inside the mouth to see if they are dry and if there are tears when the baby cries, which will both be less than expected. Another simple examination technique is to check for something called the skin turgor and what you do is just lightly pinch the skin and release it. Normally it should spring back immediately to the normal position but if it remains tented that means the skin is dry and there is dehydration. You can check the fontanelle of the baby to see if it is sunken and you can keep a tab on the urine output to see if it is reduced. So all of these things should be looked for in the examination to categorize which type of dehydration the patient has. In the severe type, there is more than 10% weight loss and the baby will be severely lethargic, look ill and every parameter will be abnormal and even more severely affected than moderate dehydration. In this type, the main feature is that you will see low blood pressure, meaning that the patient will probably be in shock. The other complication is hemolytic uremic syndrome. We will be talking about it in detail in the next video. The things you look for are jaundice, where you would see a yellow tinge in the eyes due to bilirubin accumulation. You may also see pallor in the conjunctiva if hemolysis has been going on for a while, 
and obviously you can look for the urine output in the catheter bag if there is one and see the trend of urine output in any available documentation to see if there is any reduction. Other less severe things you can look for are perianal excoriation or irritation and if there is an epi, we can inspect the contents and see what it looks like to confirm the things we obtained from the history. So once you have done your focused examination, complete the rest of the examination. You need to be brief and fast without hurting the baby and do all the system examinations and developmental assessment. So once we have finished with our examination, the next step is to go for the investigations. So basically, a lot of patients do not need specific investigations as acute gastroenteritis is a clinical diagnosis and since a lot of the investigations we do aren't very informative. But sometimes you may need to do stool microscopy to see if there are any ova or eggs of the parasites. Stool full report, which tells you if there is blood or mucus in the stool, and a stool culture to see if any specific bacterial pathogens can be identified. It's good to remember that the majority of diarrheas are due to viral pathogens and they can't be cultured in regular medium. Even though specific investigations aren't very useful, basic investigations can give you a lot of information. A full blood count will especially be needed to see if any cell lines have increased because as you know in viral diarrheas there will be lymphocytic predominance and in bacterial diarrheas there will be neutrophilic predominance. Also, you can check the packed cell volume which will be increased because dehydration causes concentration of the blood. You can also find features like thrombocytopenia if a complication like hemolytic uremic syndrome has developed. Other investigations are inflammatory markers if you are suspecting a bacterial infection and other investigations to detect complications such as serum electrolytes to detect electrolyte abnormalities, serum creatinine, and a blood picture to detect hemolytic uremic syndrome, and anything else you can think of. These are only some of the options and we may decide to do more tests or just do some simple basic tests and they don't necessarily have to be done at the same time either. It's all with clinical judgment. So that is the end of this video on examination and investigation of a patient with acute gastroenteritis. We will be talking about the management of these patients in the next video. Thanks for watching!